There are 12 European countries that have their own monarchy. Do our kings and queens serve any purpose, or should we behead these anachronistic institutions once again? To answer your questions, whether you're a subject or a citizen, please welcome the European king of aristocracy, Stéphane Bern, joining us from Paris. Stéphane Bern, bonjour. Bonjour, bonjour Alex, bonjour à tous. So you know our program, short questions, quick answers. Let's start with this rather basic question. Hello, my name's Owen Brown. I was born in Belgium and I'd like to know what's the use of having a king. Thank you. There you go, over to you. Listen, a king's role may seem simply decorative, but it's like a cornerstone. You remove that and the whole building collapses. In a way, he's the cement of a nation, an ambassador, a national symbol which brings people together. He's like a referee, and a referee cannot be the captain of either team. I think football fans will understand the metaphor perfectly. Yes, but there are some nations that do perfectly well without, such as yours, Stéphane Bern. Well, precisely. If things were going that smoothly, they'd be completely different. We wouldn't have questions about identity and power at the heart of our political debate. You see how people tear each other apart in a political party. At the very top of the state, you need to rise above that. Then there's the symbolism of nation and state, and the life of a government and shifts in power. You see that in Spain, in the United Kingdom, in Belgium, and it works quite well. The main thing is to preserve the unity of a nation, to preserve its identity, especially abroad. For example, you see some kings acting as ambassadors, as salesmen for their country, especially in times of crisis. They take their suitcases and go and sell their national label all over the world, and they open doors to trade because, in a way, they have become luxury salesmen. Another question on iTalk for Stefan Bern. Hey, I'm Antoine from Lyon in France. Can you tell me why people from countries without monarchy are fascinated by nations who do? It's true that in nations like France, for example, people are fascinated by what's happening in Great Britain in particular. Why is that? There are two reasons for that. On the one hand, because I think they have a complex. They feel secretly guilty for having decapitated our king. So there is a kind of fascination. Still today? Well, I don't feel that way, but I can understand it. And then there is the fact that we ask our head of state to be both Queen of England and David Cameron, Prime Minister. There's this permanent schizophrenia, but it's true that General de Gaulle used to say the French have a taste for princes, but they always go and fetch them abroad. At the same time, countries that have a monarchy are always a bit critical, but that's probably because they have a bit of an accountant's view of things, especially in times of crisis. They wonder how much does a monarchy cost? Well, it has to be said, it's three times cheaper than a republic because there are no presidential elections. And most importantly, it generates five times more, thanks to tourism and all the trading contracts I was telling you about, and which are signed thanks to the monarch, who will guarantee these contracts over time. Now we have a written question from Spain. So why is it that countries which have a king or a queen are usually very pro-monarchy and no criticism is tolerated in the media? Is there censorship? A question from Inma from Spain. On the contrary, there's absolutely no censorship. We saw that, for example, in Spain, where people in Catalonia burned royal effigies. Of course, there is criticism. We saw that, too, with the Spanish king's hunting accident. The king was obliged, this had never happened before, a head of state who goes on TV to apologize to the Spanish people for acting in bad taste for a political mistake, even though he's also a man who has done remarkable things during his reign. But still, he apologized for something he was criticized about. So I think it's easy to criticize, and everybody does criticize monarchies, especially as they can't really answer back. Kings and princes in Europe don't answer back. I try to defend them because I think it's too easy to just criticize them all the time of having a power which is symbolic. It's not a political power, it's a symbolic power, a moral power. And we need this kind of symbolic power, one which guarantees the respect of all the citizens. Now let me ask a question. Why are Europe's monarchies always at the cutting edge of modernity? Look at the Scandinavian and British monarchies. They're 
always ahead of countries like France when it comes to the evolution of customs and way of life, gay marriage, for example. When it comes to questions about society, all these monarchies are ahead of republics. It's surprising, isn't it? If you too have questions to ask or want to answer to Stéphane Bern, please go to our website. Another question about royalty. Hi there, my name's Wes. I'm from sunny UK. Um, I've recently seen the news that the Spanish and Swedish royal families have been caught up in a lot of scandals. And I'd like to know if this is going to have an effect on public support. Well, the gaffes of Carl Gustav of Sweden, the Spanish king's son-in-law caught up in an embezzlement scandal, that's not great for monarchy in general, for their image. Well, obviously, you can ask questions about the various scandals affecting different monarchies. Listen, as long as there's no illicit conflict of interest, as long as the monarch does his or her work properly and doesn't make any faux pas, then he or she won't be criticised. It's true that a monarchy is first and foremost a ruling family, so you can criticise the son-in-law's behaviour. But you see, in Spain, you cut down the branches once they're dead. For example, the king broke off all relations with his son-in-law, whose behaviour he criticised, even though the case hasn't gone to court yet, so we'll see what happens. As for the Swedish king's private life, it doesn't affect his position as king of Sweden in any way. Maybe, but it's not great for him as a symbol, as a brand name representing his country. Indeed, as a symbol representing his country, you can criticize him for a number of things, but some of them go back 30 years. I think that in that time he has matured in a way. He has left behind his reputation as a ladies' man and a naughty prince, and I think he's really accomplished his mission. Sweden's monarchy is very popular. Just look at the crowds that gathered for Victoria and Daniel's wedding. I was there myself, and I can tell you the Swedish people are behind their monarchy. So I think there's no regime crisis there, there's no identity crisis threatening the royal family. There may be more serious crises in Spain, for instance, with Catalonia's and other breakaway movements. There's Belgium, whose king is the cement of the nation, and maybe also the Queen of Britain. Can she guarantee that Scotland will remain part of the United Kingdom? Those are the real questions, I think, not whether the king had an extramarital affair 30 years ago. A final, more personal question for Stéphane Bern on iTalk. Hello, I'm Marin, I'm Belgian and would like to know, Mr. Stéphane Bern, you who are so familiar with royalty, why are you so interested in the monarchy? Would you like to have been king? No, absolutely not. I have no nobility fantasy, nor royal, nor princely. It's just that my family comes from Luxembourg, and the Luxembourg monarchy, the Grand Ducal family, has always defended Luxembourg's independence and identity. It's very important because my family was forced to leave Luxembourg during the war when the Nazis invaded the country in May 1940, and the Grand Duchess Charlotte really embodied resistance against the Nazi enemy. Those are things you can't forget when you've been through such hardship. I was brought up in that spirit, that our Grand Ducal family defended our identity identity, our sovereignty, our independence, against many of our powerful neighbours. So if we Luxembourgers still exist as a nation, I'm still half Luxembourger, well it's thanks to our Grand Ducal family. That's how I got so interested in royalty. One day I found out I was also French, so I tried to see where the merits of each lay, and I studied history. And when you learn about your history, you learn about where you come from, and maybe also where you're going. Thank you very much, Stefan Bern, joining us from Paris. Our thanks also to the European Parliament's audiovisual department here in Brussels. You can find out who our future guests will be by going to our website. Please don't hesitate to ask a question. See you soon on Euronews.